so I think what we have been emphasizing all the time in the Sia Pumalela project is how important leadership is. So that these are not little interventions sitting at the side, but actually a deliberate integrated strategy. Um, and ideally a strategy of which one has some evidence that it actually works, but also one that is holistic and deals with all the sorts of issues uh, that we have understood from this afternoon. So uh, it is my pleasure to ask, I'm not going to introduce each one of the vice chancellors, I'm sure they are well known to you. We're going to start with uh, Wits University and we have Professor Andrew Crouch, who's the DVC of Teaching and Learning, um, and he is going to be uh, speaking with us. His presentation is up here and we will immediately put it on for him. Professor Crutch. I've, when I was asked to prepare five things that WITS uh, are doing to try and improve student success, I thought that there are so many things and how does one in fact identify what I call five top priorities. So what I decided to do is to go high level and, and, and group some of these activities together in saying that this, this is sort of the theme of, of things that we are doing and what is the impact of that on, on student success. We all know uh, in the sector that we've come through uh, some uh, challenging times in the last two, three years and I'm grateful to say that certainly at Wits University the uh, waters have been relatively calm and uh, the boat is sailing to its, its final port which is uh, to go and deliver its cargo. Uh, there, uh, which hopefully it will do successfully. So, to yeah, to to effectively uh, give you an indication of of what we're doing at Wits, uh, we we have five faculties, uh, and uh, the five faculties are represented by the by the three by the five bubbles there. So it's engineering. Uh, it's, it's engineering, thank you. Engineering, health sciences, science, humanities, and, and, and commerce. And uh, about five, six years ago, uh, these faculties more or less had their own individual support systems because, uh, as my colleagues at WITS will tell you, our faculties are, are highly independent and they treasure their independence. And as a former dean of science there myself, I believe it's important that the faculties have the independence. But it comes with advantages and with disadvantages. The disadvantages being that each faculty has a tendency to do their own thing in terms of, of support. So about five years ago we had the Faculty of Health Sciences and the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment each having what they term there an academic planning unit, uh, which effectively provided a broad range of student support mechanisms to, to support students. And it's no wonder that these are two professional faculties. They produce uh, students for a particular profession, uh, medical students, nurses, therapeutic science students, and engineering, the various fields of engineering. So about five years ago, we embarked on a process where we, we introduced and established uh, similar support structures at faculty level, where students could engage at the, at the faculty level. So in the fact, in the case of science, uh, it's called the Science Student Success, and these are the lower three uh, faculties there. Humanity is called their Faculty Office or Support Office uh, Passport to Success, and the Commerce Law and Management, there's the Road to Success. So effectively now we have in each of the faculties an office uh, we, which is staffed with people who can receive students and in fact direct them to the appropriate assistance and support mechanisms within the uh, university. And there are many other uh, areas. What we've also done is to make sure that this is centrally coordinated, and that's the square in the middle. And we have recently appointed a senior director academic affairs to, in fact, draw these things together. So what I'm trying to point out here is that from the point of view of governance and support, we are streamlining these so that we have a generic benchmark of student support for all our faculties, a minimum level of student support, and then there are some specificities associated with the, with the various uh, faculties. This has led to a large extent to institutionalization of student support. And what I mean by that is that 
we can now look at things across the institution uh, in terms of policy changes such as the policy change for our residences where we now give preference to our uh, first year students in residence. Uh, all studies have shown that if students are in first year students are in residence you can actually roll out uh, support mechanisms and, and structures much easier. Uh, there's financial support for students over and above the announcement that was made, which the minister also referred to. Uh, we've also introduced what is known as a triple offer, which means if a meritorious student has an academic offer, they also get a place in residence and financial support. We have the social psychosocial support. We've increased uh, the uh, support mechanisms there through our Center for, for Counseling. Uh, and mental health services and we also have a range of food security programs and they are listed there. I won't go into the detail in the interest of time. We have also uh, through uh, the last five years introduced what I call the technology similar to what uh, Georgia State uh, have and I visited them with one of my colleagues and looked at their uh, portal, we called it at risk portal, we, uh, we believe it's an early warning system uh, which integrates to a certain extent the support which we can give the students. So at these faculty offices uh, there are uh, staff who can then uh, engage with the students and then direct them to the various support structures within the institution. However what the uh, at risk portal early warning system also does it, it's also a tracking system and it helps the faculties to identify students who are at risk as well as modules where students in fact uh, have difficulty and this leads to uh, earlier intervention and we can in fact refer students uh, to the various support places. Now the advantage of, of the early warning system is that all visits that a student make to a faculty is catalogued and for instance, if the student gets into trouble at a later stage, uh, there is in fact a record of uh, uh, how the student have in fact engaged with this uh, support structures and mechanisms. And then the last uh, intervention, uh, which I refer to is the Tabloid uh, dashboard system, which we have developed through the grant from Kresge. And we know we're also rolling it out to other, other universities. It, it is based on a biographical questionnaire and we have just completed the third cycle of biographical questionnaires. As the students come in uh, as first years, uh, they fill in this biographical questionnaire online. Uh, it, uh, uh, and this, at the beginning of this year, we had a very, very high participation rate. It was well over uh, 80% and one of my colleagues in Colisi uh, might present something on it later in the conference. What this biographical questionnaire gives us is gives us indication on parameters as, such as race and gender, the quintile where the student come from, uh, home languages spoken, uh, languages of instructions at school, uh, whether the student have applied for residence or non-residence, or whether the student is a first generation uh, student or not. And again, this helps the faculties to better manage the students. So I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to uh, talk about what are the results from all these in intervention. Looking at the overall module pass rate in the university, it's around 83.7%. This is all the courses that the students are registered for and the percentage that uh, the students pass or the percentage of, 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 of students that pass in a particular module. It's above 80. We would ideally want that to be 85. That's our target, but it's at 83.7%. However, if one deconvolutes that per, per annum, it doesn't look very good in the first year. And uh, we can see the brown, or you'll see it as a red curve, uh, is the lower one. Although we've brought that module pass rate in the first year up from 72 or 73% a couple of years ago to a peak in, in 2014, uh, in 2015, when fees must fall, it, does, uh, it, it in fact went down. And uh, also, that's the one factor. Secondly, we have also noticed through the biographical questionnaire that uh, the number of students who are first in their family to come to university have increased dramatically. It's almost 50% now in the case of it. And uh, we need to develop mechanisms to better manage and support uh, those students. Ladies and gentlemen, we got the instruction to, or at least a brief, to speak on 
um, on five interventions, five high-impact interventions at our university. Now, most of our faculties are, are really invested in student success. Um, our Department for Education Innovation is also very invested in student success. So people are doing a, a multiplicity, uh, really a lot of things at this point in time. So it was very difficult for me to decide on which five issues am I going to focus on. Um, by the way, when I think of the, our teaching and learning committees in all our faculties, and I realize that everyone is incredibly busy. But I do think that they enjoy being busy because they're working on something that they, that they really feel passionate ab about. I just want to start off by then identifying five of the, of the, of the topics or the issues, uh, projects that I'm going to speak about. The first is the Fly at UP project, uh, Bill, you had spoken of, referred to it earlier. Then a data analytics project, hybrid approach, uh, the hybrid project, and social learning spaces project. And then finally, our Ready uh, for Work uh, program. I need to, I suppose, at the outset, just um, give some clarity on what our definition of student success is. Um, we have broadened our, our definition of student success to not only focus on student performance at university, but also to look at what happens to our students once they leave the university or once they go to another university to pursue uh, postgraduate studies. Um, when we speak of uh, student success, we of course take cognizance of the fact that our students come to us with enormous disparities in, in, their, in their previous experiences as well as their access to resources. It's a point that I want to come back to very briefly later. And then we also have to take cognizance of the fact that the world of work um, is changing very, very uh, ra rapidly and that has to be taken into account if we want to uh, prepare our students for success beyond the workplace. Let's start with the first project. This is called the FLY at UP uh, project. FLY is a, an acronym, therefore, for the, uh, is the acronym for the finish line is yours. So in other words, we encourage our students to take responsibility for their own finish lines or for their own success. Um, this is one of the values that we want to inculcate in our students or we want to, to reinforce amongst our students, um, amongst many other values that are contained in our, uh, in our um, rubric on student uh, or graduate attributes. Um, in any event, while we say that students are responsible for their own success, we take cognizance of the fact that we have to support them in their trajectory to success. And therefore, faculties are then asked, what will you do to enhance student success? Students obviously also ask what they will do uh, to enhance student success. And I've recently started on a, on a, a roadshow to the various faculties to engage more closely with individual staff members to see how they are contributing to student success and engaging with the obstacles to student success. Um, our last meeting, which I found quite interesting, was with our um, security personnel, where we asked them, I mean, to what extent and how do you think you can contribute to student success? Our conversation with these colleagues were, was quite interesting because they also had very clear ideas about what the challenges are that students, uh, or that confront students, uh, and what one can do and what they can do, in fact, to ensure that the students, as they progress through the university, do not encounter too many obstacles that our security staff can, in fact, deal with. We've also had meetings with our, with our administrative staff and particularly our, um, the, the staff at, at um, the secretary's secretary desk or administration desk in our departments to ask them, in fact, how they can contribute to this, uh, to, to, to student success. And there again, we've received very, very helpful feedback. Um, part of the FLY project is to, to engender, for this year our focus is to engender an attitude of success among students, the whole mindset issue, and then obviously, and I'll get back to this when I look at the data analytics, monitoring um, success rates for modules and attending to high risk modules uh, through data analytics. And that then brings me to our second project, it was initiated about two years ago. Um, the chair of the data analytics uh, task team, um, John Code Lemon, is, is, is present here this morning. And by the way, uh, I need to emphasize when I speak about these projects, I'm speaking on behalf of people, the people who are doing the projects, and, and they are all present here this afternoon. The primary objective of, or the primary aim of the HIV uh, data analytics task team is to regularly scrutinize all the university's data platforms so as to identify student performance trends as well as to identify the enablers of and obstacles to student um, academic uh, success. Um, we have these meetings once, every, you used to have it once every two weeks. Um, my idea was it should be a short meeting, so we meet at, at 7.30 in the uh, on, on a Monday morning. Um, we look at the trends and each of the faculty representatives go back and see what they're going to make with the trends. Unfortunately, I had lost the battle. People were very unhappy about the fact that we had to meet at 7.30 on a Monday morning, and so now we are meeting at 8 o'clock every Monday morning, but 
one conversation to me is that we're meeting now for an hour. I do think that that that, that task signal is quite important because it engages. Yes, the, the other variables, other issues that were spoken of earlier are very important for student success. But we also have to look at what the data tells us and try to analyze that so that we can, in fact, in very fundamental ways, change um, the trajectories of uh, the success trajectories of our students. Our data tells us very important things, and all um, what it tells us, the findings that we arrive at, then determines the interventions that we determine the interventions that we uh, embark upon. Um, the Chevy team, uh, I need to point out. Um, includes um, uh, faculty representatives, and these are primarily our deputy deans responsible for teaching and learning, the Department for Education and Innovation, uh, and they are present here this afternoon, and the Departments for ITS Enrollment and Student Administration, Student Affairs, and Student Accommodation. We're trying to put everyone into this central initiative of, of student success. I must say that um, I am amazed, I said it last year, I'll say it again, that instead of our, and our task teams normally, they shrink in size once the work starts increasing. I'm amazed to see how the, the, the size of the tasking has grown and grown and become increasingly inclusive. And I think that that's a good idea. You don't want a task team that is too heavy and too cumbersome, but in this instance, we want to involve as many people as possible. And so I'm quite pleased with the progress we're making uh, in relation to that. I see I've got about two minutes left, and so I need to rush through the rest. Um, I think this, uh, this slide is self-explanatory. Um, Suffice to say that, and this is hinges on or is related to our focus on student success beyond the university. A few years ago, we decided that we would want to start diversifying our modes of engagement with the students, our modes of instruction. So we want a good balance between online or uh, online instruction or the use of e-technologies as well as um, face-to-face or contact teaching because we know that that's all our students are going to enter once they leave the university and we need to give them some facility in engaging with, 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 with online modalities. Interestingly, and Dolph has just reiterated this point to me, one of my colleagues, that we see that students who, had, uh, who engage, in, or let me read the, the, the point, um, our data analytics show us that students in the top quartile of our ClickUp users, that's the platform we utilize, outperform those in the bottom quartile by about 12% on average. So the more invested students are also in that modality of engagement, the greater the chances are, uh, are that they will be successful. Here we have a few um, images to give you, to underline what had been on the previous slide. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that 94% of our modules now have an online presence and a meaningful online presence. And that's something that's quite important to me. Um, I made a mistake with, the second, with that second uh, image. It's supposed to be 15%. While on average our students who are most active online um, and utilizing e-technologies have scored 12% more than, than, than the average other student, amongst fir first year students it's 50%, the, 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 the scores are 50% um, higher than the average other student. Social learning spaces, I've got one minute left I see, um, very self-explanatory, I'll ask you to scan those, those messages here. Um, but this is one important area, and perhaps I, 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 I'm going to risk hearing music, uh, because I think I, make, I need to make this point. Uh, we know that our, our students come into our system uh, with different, uh, different, access, different levels of access to resources. A number of students can afford um, their own devices, they can afford um, a data, a Wi-Fi data, etc. A number of our students cannot. And so we have to create the space, spaces on campus, and there are multiple, a number of these spaces. And in fact, every time we build, construct new uh, buildings, the instruction is that it has to accommodate for so, uh, uh, social learning spaces. And those social learning spaces enable students then to spend much of their time outside, if they, are, if they don't have lectures, work, working, but in the social environment. Obviously, they have free access to data uh, and facilities that they ordinarily would not have at home, particularly if they're sharing a flat with six other people or seven other people. When is the music starting? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, at DUT, we responded to the call for five interventions by thinking about, okay, which interventions we are able to actually report on at this point. And we thought, okay, where we started, we started with defining what would be our widely important goal. And we said that would be throughput, graduation on minimum time, and the attainment of graduate attributes. And we thought then those would be the two that we start with. Then the third one, the co-curriculum, away from the margin towards the center. 
and capacity building in data analytics for staff, and tutorials and mentorship programs, including our STAR program, which is the residence education program. So I'll start with the um, throughput by the analysis of cohort studies. We actually said that, we set our goal as by 2020, we will move our minimum time to graduation from 33% to 40% for the three-year diplomas. And that we will move the four-year programs to 50%. In fact, at the time, we had no four-year program that had graduated students, so that was a thumbs up. However, at this point, <laughs> at this point, we have moved, in 2013, we moved to 34%. And it, that's the cohort. And 2014 to 33%, we went down from 34% minimum time to graduation for the 2014 cohort and went back up for the 2015 cohort. But what is amazing is that for both the 2013 and 2014 cohorts, after one year, one more year, the total number of students who do complete is about 50%. 50%. And therefore, we're starting to think, oh, what is going on here? With the four-year programs, for the 2012 cohort, we had 67% when we had set ourselves for 50%. So um, although we can cheer, we are not sure if we had not set the bar too low because we did not have any four-year programs at that point. For the 2013 cohort, we are at 61%. For both of these cohorts, one more year led to 80 or 81% above. And therefore, we are at a point where we believe we maybe we need to revise our four-year completion time rates. The graduation rates for years have stayed between 24 and 24.5, but for 2017, we saw a jump to 26%. And I must mention that this is the year when we actually, I'm, I'm sure Minister is not hearing now, admitted more students than we were supposed to. <laughs> but we still got a graduation rate of 30 of 26 percent. So we are we are very happy about that. And it's not it's not just about that also just like the Beth's report, we have more graduation students we had more graduation students this year than we've ever had. We have two graduations a year, in April and in September. In April already, we have graduated 7,300 students, and there will still be more graduation in, in, in September. And therefore, what we're learning from that is that we might not be getting them to graduate on time at this point. However, we are moving the middle. The barge is, is, is getting out somehow. Okay, the second intervention was actually the focusing on making sure that our students attain the DUT graduate attributes. These were as follows. We want them to be critical and creative thinkers who work independently and collaboratively. We want them to be knowledgeable practitioners. We want them to be effective communicators. They should be culturally, environmentally, and socially aware within a local and a global context. We want them to be active and reflective learners. However, we not sure if we're there yet. Why am I saying that? We had our Center for Quality Promotion and, and, and Assurance do a short and mild, a small study on two new HDQSF aligned programs. We chose those because it is the new programs where we have integrated general education and therefore we are actually emphasizing on, on graduate attributes as well. And the results from that was that there is a lot of enthusiasm at DUT about graduate attributes. However, at this point, we need to put more emphasis in actually transferring the passion to intensity in teaching and learning practices. The recommendations from that short study was that 
we need to have orientation anytime, anyway, so that we can talk about graduate attributes and general education to students. And we're saying that because sometimes when we have early disruptions in the year, orientation gets canceled. And once you cancel orientation for first year students, most probably they will go get lost right through the year. Graduate attributes and general education must be recognized as flagship features of the university's academic approach. Staff induction as people come into DUT must include conversations on graduate attributes. And the cornerstone, which is a compulsory module for all first year students at DUT from whatever program should actually lead to the development of e-portfolios or student reflections so that they see this as important. The third, the third intervention was to build institutional capacity towards a data-informed and data evidence culture for student success. We wanted to improve access and usability to data and improve capacity to use data. Uh, Improving access is related to the fact that at the moment, every time you need data, you have to call MIS to, 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 to download the things for you and send them to you. We want it to be possible for anyone to sit on their desktop and be able to access the data that they need, but we are not there yet. And we also want to improve people's capacity to use data. That project is underway and it's been led by the group of people we call Data Jedi. And their role is to actually interact with faculties, academic development practitioners and faculties and quality promotion officers and the staff in the classrooms to actually talk about the data, what it means and what then. Okay, the fourth Oh, okay, two minutes. I thought I was faster than you. Uh, the, the fourth one is about the core curriculum, which is from the margins, we're developing and integrating core curriculum at DUT. We believe that learning is not in the classroom only. Learning takes place all over the campus and sometimes outside the campus. So we are still working. This is a project that we're still working on. We, what we're looking at, we want to see that at the end, there will be decreased student load outside of class. No, not too much dancing. Evidence of student development aligned to graduate attributes. We need evidence of integration of student development services. And you'll see just now why we want that. Evidence of data-driven analysis and assessment. We want that because the review that we have just done showed us that we have about 438 uh, student development programs all over the campus. And that cannot be manageable, and it cannot be coherent. So we are now working on benchmarking, trying to develop a framework that is going to work around just five themes, not more. The fifth one before the bell rings is the tutorial and mentoring program. I think here what I can say is that we have realized that what is important, I don't know if students will agree with me, but data shows us that when tutorials are compulsory, they work. Uh, in the interest of time, I will just go straight to the nitty um, and not waste any time, um, colleagues. Where are we? Where do we go? Oh, this one. Excellent. Um, what we want to say with this slide is that at our university, a student's success is embedded in the university institutional ecosystem, uh, uh, which ranges from um, uh, uh, students uh, and staff that are happy uh, 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 in all the three missions of the university, uh, in all the um, the, the student life, uh, the vibrant student life that we want to create, and then in providing the living and learning environment uh, in which the student can uh, succeed. So we actually see 
uh, uh, student success as embedded uh, in, that, uh, in that process. So no person is not affected uh, at our university. Everyone from the gardener to the professor plays a part uh, in making sure that uh, there is student success and they have a role that is defined. Uh, uh, what is it that they need to do uh, to, to contribute to student success? And then we have actually worked with students because we learned uh, uh, from 2015 when a uh, student uh, uh, fees must fall started that uh, we cannot work without centrally involving students uh, uh, in the issues that uh, they have to do with the student life. So uh, we have worked very hard with our students to define student success and I'm going to read that. Student success at our university uh, as defined by students is being self-aware understanding one's own strengths and weaknesses, mindfully, mindfully setting and achieving one's personal goals with persistence and commitment, you can hear that sounds like a student, and taking co-responsibility with staff and support structures to progress academically and to graduate as holistically developed, responsible citizens. That's what our students have said. Now, based on that then, uh, what are the levers of student success that uh, we have pursued? Uh, I'm not going to speak to that statistics uh, because it's a statistics that you will see in our annual report, for example, uh, that speaks uh, to how we've progressed since the merger in terms of student success and that we dipped a little bit after 2016. Uh, we are trying to get back on track. Uh, 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 2016, we know all, all, we know what happened, so we dipped a little bit down. I just want to highlight that uh, the 79% uh, of... Um, student success is a little bit higher for students that uh, are NASFAS dependent. So which means that we need to actually put more support systems besides fu funding for students that are NASFAS dependent because there are a lot of other social issues and issues of integration into the system that need to be dealt with uh, 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 to enable or to enhance student success. Now what are the enablers of student success according to the research that we have undertaken? Uh, and with students also uh, involved, is that one, student motivation and positive attitude, two, preparedness for transition to higher education, this is very important, three, humanizing pedagogies and uh, curriculum design, four, assessment and student feedback, uh, five, campus life, and six, student academic support. So we've used these enablers to structure uh, uh, student support, and I'm going to speak to each one of them to actually speak to the five uh, uh, um, interventions. The first one, transition into higher education. Uh, what we do, uh, uh, we have got a special program, uh, uh, particularly the How To Buddies is very successful where the senior students support uh, uh, the new students so that they, they integrate socially and academically. Uh, we use both face-to-face -face and online uh, uh, tools uh, in order to do that. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, first year, uh, the program is meant for first year uh, struggling uh, new students, but also senior students that need, uh, that are at risk. Uh, uh, we, that program is particularly uh, framed at, around peer support uh, in particular, peer mentoring, and help us. I've heard that the issue of uh, student advising uh, has been, uh, academic advising has been raised a few times today. Uh, uh, our faculties, particularly in engineering and health and uh, education, that program has been very successful uh, 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 to support uh, all tiers of students, uh, particularly first year and, and, and second years. And then uh, our whole teaching and learning uh, uh, philosophy is framed around what we call humanizing pedagogies. We embrace the notion of, of curriculum as more than the content of the subject. Curriculum design, uh, uh, review and renewal takes in, uh, into account the context where learning happens, the purpose of learning and teaching, the spaces and environment that we create uh, to learn and teach as so that it is conducive, the assessment philosophy that we use, uh, and the approach uh, to assessment. And I'm going to talk about that uh, quickly. The fourth um, intervention uh, is the one that uh, has to do with intervention, because if you recall, 
uh, the, the levers uh, uh, for student success uh, or the enablers that students identified had to do also with uh, the assessment philosophy and how we give feedback to students and how participatory uh, that is. Uh, so um, uh, we have got a, re a REAP uh, program because as you would uh, understand, we have actually a lot of our students coming from uh, poorly prepared uh, 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 schools. So actually actually writing and conceptualization and framing, it, is, it becomes a real problem. So we use mentors to make sure that uh, uh, students uh, work in groups to actually just learn to uh, uh, write and discuss and, and, and converse. Uh, but also we use uh, indigenous uh, uh, systems uh, to actually uh, uh, do assessment and give student feedback. We have a, a program called Amabali A to Apilisayo, which is a storytelling festival, so that we actually use uh, uh, the consciously evolved uh, 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 knowledge of students uh, 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 so that they actually have reflection from uh, uh, and they see themselves from the, the, the homes and the communities that they come from. Because uh, as you would know, that uh, when you teach, you need to start from what the student knows and take the student to where, what the student needs uh, to know. And then uh, the final um, lever uh, of our intervention has to do with campus life. Uh, we have got a very strong residence program uh, where we've got res mentors. We've got a very successful co uh, program that we call a passage program, where uh, 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 it is at residences as well, uh, where it deals with personal issues, self-awareness, acceptance, uh, emotional, uh, and send off. It works through the whole value chain uh, uh, of, of life uh, while the student uh, is uh, on campus uh, and uh, studying at, uh, at our university. And then the issues of obviously uh, uh, in the very theme of uh, uh, vibrant student life uh, is the issue uh, of uh, multilingual, uh, uh, multilinguality as well as um, leveraging um, uh, cultural uh, education uh, uh, as well. And then uh, uh, in, the, in, in the light of the fact also that we want our students when they leave, I think uh, Professor just before me spoke about student attributes. Uh, students should be engaged uh, in communities uh, where, they, where they study. So a uh, part of our uh, uh, educational uh, philosophy is that uh, when students leave, they must live with a core curricular record, also a, a core curricular certificate, not just an academic certificate because they would have been out in the communities uh, learning to serve uh, over and above getting their certificates. Uh, that brings me to the end. Thank you very much. Um, when we selected the five uh, uh, initiatives, uh, we thought, well, you know, how are we going to pick them? And I thought that the best thing that we could have done was just to focus on one and unpack the one. And that is really to look at student success through data because we believe there's where the evidence are captured, and if you got the data, and if you could interpret the data in a meaningful way, then you could come up with not only interventions, but can try to make it a systemic intervention. So, um, and I just would like to say up front that the CR Kumalela project really have shifted the focus uh, at the University of the Free State from just purely reporting information uh, to really engage with the information and engage with the data. And that is really what I would like to unpack uh, uh, at a very high level because we have got quite a large delegation here from the University of the Free State. I, I thought it's maybe half of the delegates here at the conference is from the University of the Free State. So the detail is going to be unpacked through presentations that they're going to do later on. But the, so the, the four areas or five areas I would like to talk about is really about uh, um, the strategic support for student success in data analytics. Uh, then to say, well, how do we engage with the data and use the data in our business model? To look at what the minister also referred to earlier about scaling the interventions. It's not, not only to see it as a project per se. And then also to, 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 to really lift out what Sia Pumalela also have asked the question about data across the institution. Because data uh, is very important to make sure that the data are reliable, they are one version of the truth, 
there's a steward, stewardship and ownership of the data. So it's not just really just um, uh, working with data. So I'll talk a briefly about that. And then uh, um, all the data is really about students. But how does the students use the data in a way to reflect and inform the ways and decisions that they're going to make? So I would like to start off by starting at the top. Uh, and that is really to look at the culture change. To talk about what does your strategy say in the university. And we've got a strategic plan that we developed during the course of last year. Um, it's been, it started beginning of this year. And the number one goal in that strategy is to look at student success, but also at the well-being of the student. So we look at throughput rates, we look at the achievement gaps uh, between uh, uh, um, students from different demographics, but we also look at safety and we also look at health-related issues. Because you can't really separate that. Uh, we talked about food insecurity earlier, but those other things are as important. And uh, um, coupled to that strategic plan, we have, as a precursor, developed in the institution an integrated transformation plan. A plan that really look at transformation from the mandate of the institution. And again, in there, we highlighted a learning analytics approach towards teaching and learning. So therefore, at a strategic level, and at a committed level, at, a, at, at, at the leadership level, we have said that that is the commitment that we would make as an institution. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to go through the graphs. The really what's here is, is just the representation of an indicator dashboard. And the point I would like to make here, there is an, uh, we've got a, a department for uh, institutional research and academic planning at the University of the Free State. And they generate all of these information into graphs that you can then use. But the important point I would like to make is that this is now being integrated as part of our business management, part of our operations. So faculty committees, uh, 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 university committees, uh, um, and in departments start to engage with the information. Because that's exactly what you would like to do. You would like to make sure that the information should work for you and in the other way around. I also would like to talk a little bit about the scaling of, this, uh, of the various initiatives that we have. Uh, this one, we only, uh, I'm only going to pick two in this case. We got the Academic Student Tutorial Excellence Program. It's called the A-STEP Program. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about academic advising as two components of that. Um, again here, if you look at the A-STEP data, this graph really just indicates to you that uh, uh, we have had an increase in the number of students that participated in the uh, tutorial sessions. We also have had an increase in the number of sessions that we have, uh, that we have presented at the university. Now, this sort of take-up means that the message is going out there. And this is the data that we actually track to be able to feed back and to say, well, does that intervention actually make a difference? Now, often, it's, it's very uh, 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 good for people and for academics and non-academic uh, staff to see visually what's happening with the information. And there's where the data analytics comes in. Uh, um, and the data, unfortunately, we haven't got music with this, but that probably would have been far greater. But on the right-hand side, we could avatars. And the different blocks represent different faculties that we have at the university. And if you take, and I haven't got a point here, but if you look at the, the middle block uh, on the, at the top, it's the faculty of education. What that actually say is that if you look at the average attendance uh, on the x-axis and the pass rate on the y-axis, that in the Faculty of Education, you, 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 that's the trend that you would like to see. An increase of the average attendance uh, yield an increase in the, in, the, in the pass rate. But if you look at the Faculty of Humanities, for instance, then you see that is not necessarily the case. And you, you, you see here the, the, the bubble size indicate the demographic uh, that the avatar represents on the right-hand side. The question that this representation asks you, it doesn't give you the answer. It asks you that the trends that you expect is not necessarily there in your faculty. 
So it asks you the question why. And that is then you can go back to information and the data and try to improve that. So this is how we try to use analytics in a, in a real-time way to be able to attract the attention of, uh, of, 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 of academics and, and non-academic staff that's involved uh, with, with these sort of engagements. We also have academic advising, uh, um, and these are the various initiatives that we do apply advising to, from registration uh, uh, right through to resident life collaboration, uh, um, and, uh, um, and the number of students that participating in these advising sessions is in fact increasing by the day. We also have, during uh, uh, 2016, when we had the Roads Must Fall and Feast Must Fall campaigns, um, we had challenges in trying to bring advice across to students. And at the university, the Free State, we developed a, 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 a guide called Coffsy Advice. And that guide uh, really helps you, uh, not only providing information to the students with relation to uh, registration or examination, but anything that the student actually needs to know is uh, uh, incorporated in this uh, advice uh, uh, booklet or guideline. I know that there's two minutes left, but I, this is a very technical slide, but the, what I wanted to illustrate here is that it is about data. And if your data is not reliable, it's not one version of the truth, because you could have you could different inputs of data that can come in your system. So what this project also has helped us to rethink the way that we manage data at the university. And last year, we developed a white paper on corporate, and that's more institutional data management, try to integrate the data from the various sources, but also try to apply data in a meaningful way. Not only the student success data, but data that coming from other sources to be able to help us uh, understanding the business of what we're into and the business of the university. And then finally, uh, um, it's also important that the data is not only about the student, it's also for the student to engage with the data itself. And, and uh, um, in fact, there are going to be a presentation uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, Molotzani Molotzani later on, um, that look at machine learning and predictive analytics uh, to help students reflect on the impact of their choices and their behaviors. And I would like to invite you to listen to that paper. I think it's tomorrow uh, uh, or Thursday. That paper is going to be presented. And uh, finally, um, I would like to, to thank really Saidi and Sia Pumalelu and the Kresge Foundation, specifically Bill Moses, uh, for the contributions and the fact that uh, we could have developed this level of expertise uh, 